This episode of AD History is brought to you by NordVPN. Have you ever wondered if the Jewish people ever had a real chance to return to Jerusalem under Roman rule? Or if everyone thought Hadrian was as good an emperor as he's often made out to be? Well, do we have a story and interview for you? This is the AD History Podcast. Weaving a tapestry of world history from 1 AD to HD. Powered by TGNR. Get your good news that's real news at TGNR by visiting tgnreview.com. Now here are your hosts, Paul K. DiCostanzo and Patrick Foote. And brought to you via London and New York City, you are listening to the AD History Podcast. I am Paul K. DiCostanzo and I'm joined with my co-host... Patrick Foot, Patrick, how are you today? I am great. I'm absolutely perfect, Paul. It's another wonderful day. Another wonderful day in November in England. Uh, November's not at its be- most... No, but England isn't at its most beautiful in November, that's for sure. But I'm still happy getting through this. 2020 is almost behind us, which is super exciting. Paul, how are you doing? I am well. And I am particularly happy today because we are joined by a special guest, an author of an excellent travel and cultural guide to Israel, an armada of cats travels in Israel, in addition to being a fantastic Jewish history YouTuber. And this is one part that I really, really tickled me in the best way. And somebody who had an uncredited role as an extra in the epic from 2017, Dunkirk. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen and 80 history listeners, we have Sam now. Sam, thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's nice to be here. Thank you for joining us. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, and you have joined us at the most opportune time because the uh, period of history we're, we are looking into uh this uh, in this episode of 80 history is a very pivotal time in jewish history so it's amazing to have you here for this moment oh yes i'm, I'm happy to be here oh it's absolutely a pleasure you you, you are a mm. natural connection to what we're doing today i'm glad to hear it i've been listening to this podcast since the start and i'm uh, mm. really excited to be on there that's thank just you. always so cool to hear yeah. thank you thank you so much thank you for listening and of course thank you for being here And today, of course, after we get our usual business out of the way in just a moment, we're going to, of course, be covering 131 AD to 140 AD. In the case of Sam, moving inside his specialization regarding Jewish history, specifically regarding the events leading up to and including the Bar Kokhba revolt, which has tremendous implications for centuries to come. But before we do that, uh, we need to hear from our sponsor for today's episode, NordVPN. So yes, thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring today's episode of AD History. The internet can be a pretty scary place at times. Not only could anybody be trying to access your online information, but sometimes parts of the World Wide Web are locked out to you simply due to the part of the world you are browsing from. A VPN can deal with both these issues, and Nord is the best VPN we here at AD History have ever used. By logging onto our Nord secure servers with military-grade encryption, your data is protected, and by accessing one of their servers from another part of the world, you can browse the internet as if you are in that part of the world. Nord simple, clean design makes it super easy to use and quick to understand. And should you run into any issues with Nord, their 24-7 custom support will be able to lend a hand. And Paul, I know you've been using Nord for quite some time now. Almost two years, in fact. And so I work naturally both with TGNR, AD History, and a variety of things on a number of content management systems, in addition to everything else that I do that encompasses my own personal activity. And the fact of the matter is, for me, in addition to being able to access materials outside of where I am geographically, I fundamentally believe that one must do everything possible to protect their anonymity, their information, and be able to surf the World Wide Web as they see fit. And I am so drawn, and I find this so important, that now especially with Nords, up to six devices on a single account, I have 100% insisted that everybody in my family use NordVPN 
and they absolutely love it. So if you're taking it from experience for somebody who absolutely emphatically believes in the product, I don't just use it for my professional needs. I don't just use it for my personal needs, but I need it to protect and feel very secure for protecting something far more important, my family. That is great to hear, Paul, that you have so much trust in uh, NordVPN. And I've actually recently found a new use for NordVPN. Uh, before we began recording, Paul, we were talking about how much we're enjoying the brand new series of Spitting Image. <laughs> oh, it's absolutely brilliant. It's so great from uh, Cummings at Epsilon 5 to uh, Trump and the way he tweets his uh, helping hand or helping something else he used to help him tweet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's really good stuff. We need, I guess it's, it's a perfect time to have a spitting image, but it's actually behind a paywall in the UK and in the US. However, they put their episode, full episodes out for free in other countries on YouTube. So I've been using Nord to connect to servers in other countries such as Brazil and watching a spitting image full episode uh, for completely free thanks to Nord. And that is an amazing way I have been using NordVPN. And I'm sure many of you guys out there will enjoy Nord in that sort of way as well. And um, Paul, what amazing offer have NordVPN got for listeners of AD History? NordVPN is offering listeners of AD History an exclusive Black Friday deal. That deal being 68% off a two-year plan and an additional not one, not two, not three, but four months completely free. This is a limited time deal, so to benefit, you have to act fast. And to enjoy this deal, simply go to nordvpn.com slash history and use the coupon code ADHistory, all caps, no spaces, which will be linked in the description. Thank you so much to Nord for supporting AD History. And remember, that's 68% off a two-year plan and an extra four months for free, in addition to their 30-day money-back guarantee that is an absolute no-brainer. Visit nordvpn.com slash history and use the code ADHistory, all caps, no spaces, to get on board today. And thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this episode of the AD History Podcast. Now, let's queue up our necessary, obligatory, now legendary AD History Podcast ground rules. 1. Evaluate events in the context they occurred. 2. Over the span of recorded history, the way it was recorded, its methodology, and the facts that are important have changed immensely. How we view history today is not necessarily how we viewed it 50 years ago. 3. Nothing in history was inevitable. And four, history and the past is like a different country. Sam, you have the floor. Probably one of the most famous events of the decade of 131 to 140 is the Barkoch Revolt, which was the third and bloodiest of all the Jewish Roman wars. The interesting thing and perhaps the frustrating thing about this particular revolt is that we know more about what went into it and what came out of it than what actually happened in the war. The reason for that is that we only have three major sources to tell us about this war. We did not have a Josephus who was in it and wrote about it afterward. Our main sources are Cassius Dio, who had not been born yet, I don't think, when this war happened. Another one is the Mishnah, which is the legal minutes, I guess, of the great Sanhedrin, not a history. And the third are actual letters from Bar Kokhba, which were found in a hiding place in the Judean desert, which are not as informative as you might think, because they are written by people who already know what's going on to people who already know what's going on. So they lack a lot of important context. So there's a lot of guesswork in the actual military history, but the causes and the effects are far reaching and still with us. For AD history listeners, you being one of them, you know, the last time that we touched on anything significant in regards to uh, Jewish history uh, in, in our episode, in our catalog, came after the destruction of the temple and, of course, what happened at Masada. So what has been the fallout since then? How do we find ourselves basically walking into the Quito's war that had 
so profoundly had perhaps profound implications for the Bar Kokhba revolt that followed? Well, I'm glad you asked that because there are really two parallel trends that are leading into this conflict. And the first one is sort of the realpolitik coming out of the first uh, Jewish Roman war and which includes the Ketos revolt. Now today we have this very simplified idea that when the temple was destroyed, the Jewish people were taken out of Judea and scattered to the winds. And that is not really correct. It's much more complicated. In reality, the Jewish diaspora had been happening since the Persian period. In fact, for a few centuries by this point, uh, more Jews were living outside of Judea than in it. And the sort of dissipation of the Jewish population within Judea would actually continue for many centuries after this point and really culminate even in the First Crusade. So conservative estimates put the Jewish population at the end of the first Jewish Roman War, around four million. The higher ones used to put it at seven. I think it's somewhere around five uh, because we have a general idea of the proportions of where people were. So about two million Jews were living in Judea. About two million were living elsewhere in the Roman Empire, a million in Egypt alone. We'll get to the last million in a second. Of those two million, most of them were in other parts of the Eastern Empire. But after the first Jewish Roman War, tens of thousands of prisoners, prisoners of war, but actually mostly women and children, were uh, sold off mainly in Italy and to an area of Upper Germania where Vespasian during the war had also quelled revolt and resettled some of his loyal officers there with their Jewish slaves. In sort of the convention of the Hebrew language at that time, the area of settlement way on the other side of the Alps came to be known as Ashkenaz. And this was kind of the beginning of Ashkenazi Jews. Obviously, over the centuries, more people would come up from Italy, but that's how it began. Now, during the first Jewish-Roman War, most Jews were not in the area that was under attack or what that was being fought over. Most were in far-flung places, either you know, paying no mind to it or actually sympathizing with the Romans. But after this arrival of all these people who had been in the war, you start to see this change in perspective that percolates over several decades. And uh, eventually that leads to the Quitos War. Now, the Quitos War, it was part of Trajan's Parthian campaign, fundamentally. And that's where we come to that last million, because a million Jews about were living outside of the Roman Empire entirely. Some in India, some in Ethiopia, some in what is now Yemen, but most of all in Mesopotamia, which was the heart of the Parthian Empire, and it was a, a real melting pot. When Trajan invaded Mesopotamia, many Parthian forces, including many Jewish forces, continued fighting against the Romans from behind their lines. Word of this got out to the West, and all of a sudden, uh, there are these kind of self-starting rebellions all over the Eastern Empire of Jewish diaspora communities. You have met these truly enormous massacres uh, of Roman settlers by Jews in Cyrenaica, in Cyprus. Uh, eventually, a Jewish army invades Egypt from the West, uh, and eventually this all comes back to Judea. Now, this war, this Quitos War, is not really a conventional war. It's just a series of uprisings that are happening to be very big. And at the end of it, the new emperor, Hadrian, basically concludes that this is an unforced error. We need to basically make things right with the Jews in the empire, who at this point are like 8% of the empire's population, really. That's a, similar to the percentage of Americans who are of Italian ancestry today to just give you an idea of how visible they would have been. So what he does is he takes the Jews of Cyrenaica and Cyprus and actually expels them back to Judea and plans to rebuild the Jewish temple. Now, what happened next is kind of a matter of contention. The Talmud says that the plans to rebuild the temple were actually sabotaged by the Samaritans. Now, uh, the Samaritans, for listeners, are the descendants of the Northern Kingdom of Israel. They actually still exist. Uh, they have a religion that's very similar to Judaism, 
but they still have a temple, they still have priests, they still make sacrifices, and their temple's a little bit north, uh, near the town of Nablus in the West Bank. There had always been, for a long time, there had been a lot of animosity between Jews and Samaritans. Uh, that's why the Good Samaritan is mentioned uh, in the Gospels. I personally do not think that this is what happened for two reasons. One, uh, I don't see any reason why the Samaritans would have had any input in the design of the temple when they already had their own, and they did not consider the Jerusalem temple to be the original. The other is that when the Bar Kokhba revolt was fought, we have a decent amount of evidence that the Samaritans, or at least a large number of them, fought on the side of the Jews. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Another complicating factor of this is that the Mishnah, as we now have it, was compiled by uh, a man named Yehuda Hanasi, who was a close friend of several Roman emperors uh, and may have made edits. What I think is that eventually Emperor Hadrian was the one who pulled the plug on this operation. And to understand why, we need to understand the other trend that's sort of coming into a collision course here. And that is sort of the codification of Roman antisemitism over the past century up to that point. During the days of the late Republic, there had actually been some conflict with the Jews within Rome. But during the Julio-Claudian dynasty, there was a fair number of philosophers, people like Seneca, who actually were very admiring of the Jews. They found the idea of monotheism very appealing. And this is something that a lot of other people, uh, other philosophers, found threatening. And one of those, even though he was sort of before Seneca, he was not alone. Or one of those figures was an Egyptian Greek, a Greek person from Egypt, named Appion, which is different from Appian the historian. This is a different historian. Appion was uh, working mainly during the time of Caligula. Uh, at some point during Caligula's reign, wrote a history against the Jews. We don't have a copy of this history. We only know it exists because some 60 years later, in the 90s, Josephus wrote a debunking of it, basically, called Against Appion. So from him, we actually have what was said in Appion's lost work. And one of the things that Appion said was that, one, Jewish history was not remarkable. It was not worthy of study because classical Greek writers had not written about it. And another was something he had actually plagiarized from a historian named Manetho a few centuries earlier, which said that Jews hated the Greeks so much that once a year they would actually kidnap a Greek and make a human sacrifice to them. And this obviously wasn't true. I think Judaism is actually one of the more blood phobic religions. Um, but it rang true in certain circles because the Jewish temple was enclosed. It was an enclosed building. The actual sanctuary itself, not even regular Jews could go inside. You had to be a priest or a Levite to go inside. You had to be the high priest to go inside the Holy of Holies. And to Greeks in the East who would have been very used to things like the, the, the Parthenon, or various open air temples, they found the idea of worshiping in an enclosed space very suspicious. So to say that, oh, they, if they're behind closed doors, they must be doing human sacrifices, that was not that much of a leap in the mind at that time. Another thing that they really found uh, offensive was that Jewish men were circumcised and they thought it was an offense to like the perfection of the male form. But one of the things that bothered them most was that not only were they worshiping in enclosed spaces, but they were worshiping a god that had no physical form or image, which they just found kind of innately terrifying, I guess, in an eldritch kind of way. Why were there no images of uh, their god, the Jewish god at that time? The idea, I believe, and I'm not a professional historian, so... Don't, <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> don't take this to court. Idolatry, as it was understood back then, is kind of foreign to us now. They didn't just believe that idols were representations of gods. They believed that idols were actual physical manifestations of gods in that physical form. Judaism kind of evolved out of sort of Semitic paganism, the same religion that would eventually spin off into the Carthaginians. Quiet, that was gradually phased out as the religion became more monotheistic, more dedicated to El Elyon. And something I do, I do want to weigh in here about, but... 
you know, something Patrick and I and anybody who deals in this portion of history in this portion of the world at that time, when you're talking about the Romans, th there's this certain unofficial pantheon that is the whole concept of the five good emperors. And you and I had c communicated on th this, Sam, and at the time I wasn't sure if it had been not, uh, uh, Niccolo Machiavelli or Edmund Burke who started it. And it's interesting because the fact that that has so ingrained itself as a saying, as a concept, easily 1,500 years after that point in time, and in some ways in a very passive way, making us look at them very differently. And there, I'm getting to this for a reason. One, and this is important to know, if you're familiar with the, the best-known work of Niccolo Machiavelli, you'll know that his definition of good is not exactly talking in a moral sense. And two, of course, Hadrian, of course, eventually changed his tune and he, tune, and he was anything but good to the Jewish people. Where did this turnabout come? Because it was not just a 180. It was absolutely violent and heinous in his change of course. Well, I think it factors into a phenomenon that you have actually spoken about in previous episodes, which was the growing veneration of Greek culture in the West, in Rome. Uh, one of Appian's biggest fanboys, uh, if I can use the term, was Absolutely. Tacitus. And Tacitus okay, yeah. uh, was someone who was a contemporary of Hadrian and who was quite uh, fondly liked by Hadrian. Tacitus took what Appian was saying about the Jews and he made it uh, even more grandiose. He claimed, uh, and I don't have the exact words, um, he said something to the effect that uh, Jews are just massive sexual deviants. Now, it's impossible to know in what way, because we don't, we can't know. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious where this concept of sexual deviation was demarcated. I think it's one of those things that they were so used to being able to see everything that to come into contact with these people who did a lot of things behind closed doors that they were not party to, it was sort of easy to infer a lot of things that were not really the case. Um, gotcha. Like he, he actually said, we can't know why, in what way they're sexual deviants because they won't have sex with us, but you can bet that they are. <laughs> those, so are all, those are practically his exact words in Latin. It's amazing. It's amazing how yeah. the mind fills in the gaps with information. Exactly. Something I was curious to know about when we're talking about on the subject of Hadrian being the good emperor. Um, and, and everywhere you look about Hadrian, it will always be, oh yeah, he was one of the good emperors. I mean, a lot of sources say he was Rome's best emperor. Far few between in the popular books, in like the sort of popular image of him, you'll find anything bad to see, you, you find anyone saying anything bad about the man but then you turn this sort of uh, you look into this sort of area of his reign and this was anything but good and like as as a jewish person yourself how do you feel when you, you you hear this guy being referred to as a good emperor one of the best emperors i don't think i can find i i, I don't think i can fully express that until uh we finish mm. what happens yes the interesting thing about that is that Hadrian was not a particularly popular figure in Rome either, but we'll get back to that. So it would seem, and we don't really know the exact order of events at this point, that fair, but it seems that fairly late in the game, Hadrian changed his mind. Uh, she did rebuild Jerusalem, but he rebuilt it as Ilia Capitolina, um, which was uh, named after Jupiter Capitolinus but also after his family, the Elia family, or his gens, which is like a clan in uh, ancient Rome. And that definitely was just the first middle finger to the Jews and even some of the Christians mm. that were living there at the time, if I'm correct. Yes. Almost certainly. Uh, in fact, not only did Hadrian uh, build a temple to Venus uh, on the site of Jesus' crucifixion, he also built a temple to Jupiter Capitolinus on the site of the Jewish temple with a giant bronze statue of himself. Jews were what a good emperor. <laughs> banished from the city. Um, the city had been abandoned for a long time at this point. It was just the most infuriating and inflammatory thing. Now, this is where things get kind of fuzzy. At this time, there was a power... There were, at this time, there was still a Jewish power structure. 
the great Sanhedrin, which had kind of been the court and the legislature of Judea when it was independent, still existed, but it was just an instrument of Jewish law at this point. And it had its leaders, uh, who at this point were now in the city of Yavne, which is uh, sort of south of Tel Aviv now. But the person who was really working to maintain connections between Judea and the Jewish diaspora was a rabbi named Akiva ben Yosef. Uh, Akiva was the rabbi of a very small town called Bnei Brak, so he did not have a whole lot of official authority. But it was he who had sort of taken it upon himself to maintain this connection with the whole rest of the Jewish world, to make sure that everyone still knew what was going on, and that he would be controlling the narrative. And at this point, he actually was imprisoned and uh, tortured to death by the Romans for planning an insurrection because he had proclaimed to the Jews of the Diaspora that he had found the Messiah and that his name was Shimon Bar Kokhba. His actual birth name was Shimon Bar Kosiba, uh, which is a Aramaic name, but he had changed it to Bar Kokhba, which means son of the star, which is reference to the book of Isaiah, I believe. A star shall come out of David. Because the understanding by this point was that to be a Messiah, you had to be a direct male descendant of King David. The zealots had all, the zealot leaders had all been descendants of King David. Uh, Jesus had been a descendant of King David, uh, and it goes on like that. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, once again, as a listener, and this is something we actually talked about way back in our first episode, that when you're looking at Matthew and Luke, Matthew, who's definitely something that either came came out of or was tailored to. A, a, a sect of Christianity that was still very close to Judaism, and Luke, that as far as we can tell, was catered to both women and Jews. You'll notice those genealogies are very, very deliberate, and one of the deliberate landing points, of course, is coming from the house of David. So I'm glad you mentioned that, because I think that is awfully Well, important. it actually wasn't that uncommon to encounter direct really? male descendants of David. No, in Babylonia, oh, wow. uh, there was an entire pretender office called the Exilarchs, and they uh -huh. would continue all the way into the 11th century. Wow. With like coronation That's really interesting. And, everything. and many of the most uh, influential rabbis were descendants of King David. Uh, Hillel the Elder was a descendant of King David, even though he was someone who came from a fairly poor background. It was, it was something that people knew. It wasn't something that was sort of relevant in the day-to-day, -day, but it was just that kind of received knowledge. If you were in a family that was descended from David, it was just something that people kind of knew in, in the background. Now, okay. the trouble with Bar Kokhba is that we don't know anything about him outside of this revolt. We don't know what he did before the war. We don't know where he came from. Uh, we only know that he was the leader of this rebellion that began around the time of Akiva's execution and the reopening of Jerusalem as Elia capital. I take it outside of his correspondences, which you mentioned, was there any other contemporaneous or even near uh, contemporaneous account about the man, at least in this very specific portion of his life that survived at all? Not that survives today, which is interesting okay. because Rabbi Akiva was actually the author of the Haggadah. Um, which we still use today, which is like the script for the Passover Seder. But we don't have anything about, we don't know anything biographical about Bar Kokhba. We're not even certain how he died. Uh, we don't know anything about where he came from, what he did before the war. Uh, really, he's kind of a, a cipher. And Rabbi Akiva, even though he kind of composed the idea of the Haggadah, he was this great proponent, this uh, great uh, cheerleader for Bar Kokhba in the lead up to the war, but he, none of his writing about who he really was uh, survives either. If he had any specific writing that was kept by the powers that be, the, one of the problems about ascertaining information is that Bar Kokhba was not uh, a popular person when the war was over among the Jewish authorities at the time. And really he wasn't even until the modern era. He, his legacy has been kind of uh, repurposed recently uh, in a fairly controversial way. Explain that. Okay. Um, so leading up to and coming out of the establishment of the State of Israel, Bar Kokhba was kind of valorized as this military hero fighting against the oppression of the Romans, fighting to reestablish a Jewish state. 
uh, which was not really popular at the time. Uh, it, one of the things they did was that Lagba Omer, which actually commemorates the death of someone many decades after Bar Kokhba, uh, was repurposed as sort of a martial commemoration of the Bar Kokhba revolt, at least here. That's the holiday with the bonfires on the beaches and what have you. Uh, and we have these stamps with him, the archer. The, the sign of the archer is a very iconic image of Bar Kokhba. But it really is something that has only become, only become commemorated or celebrated in very recent history. And not without controversy. So tell me more about this controversy, because I do believe it's relevant simply because obviously history in context, but its implications are important as well in terms of how we view that context. What's so controversial about this celebration? I'm, I'm curious about that because I, I don't know, but you do. Well, there's a very strange uh, and I would say mostly antagonistic relationship between uh, Zionism and religious Judaism, especially ultra-Orthodox Judaism, certainly in the lead up to the creation of the state. Uh, in fact, the establishment of the country was in many ways framed as a, a way to escape religion, to escape the trap, uh, this cycle of not taking action, not uh, questioning when bad things happen and accepting it as part of God's plan. Uh, and to very religious Jews, it was seen as a very blasphemous thing to create your own country because that's the Messiah's job. And in that respect, Bar Kokhba, because he failed as a messiah, was not the messiah. That's not something to celebrate. By a similar token, Hanukkah was actually not very popular as a holiday until the Middle Ages because it had no divine element. It was purely a patriotic and militarist holiday only in the, I want to say, Savaraic period, which is very late, pre, right before the Muslim conquests. Uh, the Midrash was discovered of the miracle of the oil, and that made it okay to celebrate Hanukkah. So by the same token, Bar Kokhba has been kind of repurposed in a similar way. I see. Just much later. It, and I'm just extrapolating here. I take it that it does serve some benefit in, in creating, at least the way I interpreted what you said, uh, some adding more substance to the idea of stories that enhance the idea of a of a sovereign independent israel yes yeah although that itself is sort of started to fall out of favor as we've taken as the state has continued to exist these sort of attempts to create parallels in the foundation have been called into question are these really things we should be commemorating are these are we really telling these stories the way they should be told honestly uh, you mentioned that earlier in an earlier episode with Masada. Uh, that itself is very controversial here. Is it the Masada or is it the IDF that uses Masada as a site where, uh, where they get sworn in, I, I believe it is? Some, some units are sworn in there, but not all, not most. Right. It's, it's specific to certain units. Now, I might guess why it would be controversial but it pales in comparison to somebody knowledgeable and on the ground. What's so controversial about that particular incident? Since we've covered it before, I think this would be a fascinating contribution here. Uh, well, the fall of Masada was just, uh, it's something that we're not yeah. sure Josephus' writings about it were correct. Uh, in fact, we're pretty sure they he were. Not there. as many people were there. Most of the people who were there actually survived. Exactly, he wasn't there. Most of the people who were actually there survived. Um, most of them were civilians. And the people who were holding Masada were just bandits who were sort of uh, spent most of their time killing other Jews during the war. And in fact, there's a, a pretty prominent Jewish terrorist group uh, operating, or that operated here in Israel a few decades ago that was named after them, the Sicarii. I see. This is something that I am curious about just on that note, and we'll get back to the, the prime artifact in a moment, it, do we have at least a decent idea? How, how many do they believe were actually holed up in Masada during the siege? I don't. I, I, I don't know the exact number. I believe of the actual Sakari mil militants, it was fairly low, like uh, a few dozen. If there were just bandits, and relatively speaking, there weren't 
all that, many of them in general, why did the Romans spend so much time and resources quite literally surrounding the place trying to starve themselves out for months and then ultimately take all the time and effort to create amazing, you know, huge earthworks that are still there today just to take out a very, you know, relatively speaking to their own numbers, small number of criminals? Oh, well, they weren't there to take out just them. Um, there had been other cleaning up operations in that area against uh, Judah Benari, who had tried to bring okay. the Judean army back together. They had a last stand at Machaerus. Masada was right across, and uh, they needed to be dealt with because this was a major fortress that uh, was of enormous strategic value. Okay, I, I appreciate you clarifying mm -hmm. that because I think that is uh, it's important because you get you kind of get this this visualization that you just have Roman troops camped out there over an extended period of time, and all they're doing is pretty much sitting themselves sitting out the siege obviously constructing the ramp. And so I was curious about that. I, that. What you said makes a heck of a lot more sense to me. No, th this was part of a larger, it was the final battle of a much larger okay, campaign. Okay, that, that certainly makes a good deal of sense. Now, in terms of the actual, you, you say we don't know that much about Bar Kokhba. Tell us more about the, the revolt itself and, and how it went down. What, how was this organized? What what were the what were the tactics being used to fight the Romans? Because I have to imagine it would have been pretty difficult to fight them out in the open in ranks. So how exactly were they taking on the Romans? Well, uh, you'd be absolutely correct because uh, it seems that they had considered that a failing of the first Jewish Roman war to fight a conventional war from the start. They we don't and I said like I said this information is all fragmentary. We have to kind of piece this together ourselves. It would seem that Bar Kokhba, and he had some very capable uh, officers organizing this with him, had a very big network, like all over the Judean mountains, up into Samaria even, of cave hideouts, where these would all be staging points. It's almost like um, the Vietnam War, where you would have these underground hideouts just all over the mountains. Uh, all within, you would, you would be able to get between them fairly quickly. You'd be able to send information and disseminate it very quickly, and you would be able to do it without being seen. You could go between these places at Israel's night. Israel's Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, yeah, uh, that's actually a great uh, comparison. Um, and to basically strike out against the Romans periodically. And what's interesting about this is that they had a lot of people volunteering who were not... Uh, accustomed to being in these sort of revolts. There were Samaritans, like I said. There were, it says foreigners. We don't know whether it means Jews from outside the empire or people from within the empire who weren't Jewish and from other parts of the East. But there was a, a great deal more sort of plurality or a greater diversity of people participating. If I remember correctly from your videos, wasn't it, how'd you put it, it was very likely both the former and the latter? Yeah. Uh, I, I think so. But that's just me. Okay. Uh, that, that's plenty fair. Now, at least in, in, in the short term, what was the, what was the revolt able to achieve? Well, uh, pretty early on, they were actually able to get the uh, Roman legion stationed in Elia gone. Uh, they, they fled and the capital was back under Jewish control. Now, they did not move into the capital, but they expected to at some point. And they, uh, Bar Kokhba's sort of shadow government even started minting coins with the temple depicted on them. And that's how serious this was. Uh, at that point, they were actually able to start putting out uh, a conventional war. They were starting to organize out in the field because they had secured this sort of system, and now they were able to strike out against whole legions. Uh, in the first Jewish-Roman War, there was one Roman legion that was basically wiped out uh, right at the beginning at Bet Horon. There were at least two, possibly three legions uh, that, that that happened to in the Bar Kokhba revolt. Um, at a certain point, about half the entire Roman army was in Judea fighting against Bar Kokhba. Wow. And one of the uh, legions that was wiped out we have no idea where they were wiped out. They just disappear at some point in the, in the record. Is it? They set out, I think, from Caesarea 
And th- there's no mention of them in the record again. Uh, the 22nd Deuteriana. I remember that now. And it's reasonable to extrapolate that they were taken out, that because they were professional Roman soldiers, there's less than a chance of hell they would have deserted? Uh, I, I don't know where they would have deserted to. I mean, okay. it's pretty much Rome in all directions at that point. But yeah, this was a far, far bloodier conflict than the first Jewish-Roman War, uh, even though it was much shorter. Uh, the first Jewish-Roman War was seven years long about. This was just three, maybe four years. Well, that's interesting, Sam, because I remember I was looking at the figures, and they are absolutely astonishingly high in terms of the deaths that occurred because of this, most of which, of course, as you mentioned, were both civilian and, and children and, and things of that nature. If I remember correctly, were, are, are we talking about upwards of one million dead? That includes uh, okay. some things that happened at the end of the war. Okay. So we need to get there first. Um, eventually, the Romans had enough power in the, the, the province that the, the, the Jewish revolts could not keep up with. Uh, they started rooting out these places. They started rooting out these fortresses like the Herodium, uh, which was the tomb of Herod and was also a fortress. They had to abandon that, and at long last, what remained of the revolt was all pushed back to one town called Betar, which is near Jerusalem. And they surrounded it, and Hadrian himself arrived to fight at Betar. Now, when he arrived in Judea, he found, it in such, he found the Roman legions in such disarray that he did not address the Senate in the proper way, very emphatically. Usually, you would say, I and the army are in health. He just said, I am in health. But when they came to Betar, it was just a complete, like, it, it was like Masada 2.0, uh, except with the actual number of people, many, many more people than at Masada. Um, and Betar is a very famous, one of the foundational uh, Israeli organizations, the conservative one is, is named after Betar. It's, well, it's named after Betar, and it's also a a, uh, an acronym for something else. Hadrian gets on the scene. The Romans are in total disarray, but the, the revolt is no longer able to have the upper hand because the, the strategic redeployments and reorganization and everything that's important. What's the end game here? Well, uh, after Betag falls, we don't know what happened to Balkhoff, but we know he died. Um, there's some stories that he was turned over to the Sanhedrin who had him killed. I don't believe this. Um, there's another story he was killed in battle, possibly not in combat, but just during the battle from something else. Uh, we don't really know. And uh, in my opinion, it doesn't really matter. What really matters is what happens after the war. So over the course of this war, hundreds of thousands of Jews have died either in battle or from disease and starvation that became a big problem as a result of the fighting. First, what happens is that almost everyone at Betar is killed. Um, only one person that I know of actually survived it and went on to become an adult, and it was uh, a later head of the Sanhedrin. Not only is almost everyone at Betar killed, but they are not allowed to be buried, which is a very uh, sacrilegious thing in Judaism. You have to, not only in, in Judaism, not only do you have to bury people, but you cannot let them, you cannot let bodies leave your sight until they are buried. That's why burials are so often so fast in Judaism. The dead of Betar were just left out there to rot for two years. After that, Jewish rituals were banned just across the board, and Jewish villages in the area I call Old Judea, which is the area around and south of Jerusalem, were basically Roman soldiers went through them and just killed everybody. And they went through this process over months. This was a systematic genocide. In fact, this was the first major genocide against the Jewish people. And oh, between the fighting and this clearing out, about a million Jews were killed. Wow. Mm. Uh, this is, yeah. So imagine the, the population of the Jewish population of Judea goes from 2 million to 1 million over this four year period. Now, in the north, not much happens. In, in the Galilee, they pretty much get away. Uh, Jewish ritual is suspended, it's, it's outlawed. Uh, there, are, there are competing arguments as to whether circumcision was outlawed. 
uh, I'd have to assume it was. There, there's argument over whether that happened before or after the war. I think it was after. And basically, uh, Jews are banned from setting foot in Jerusalem, and Hadrian just kind of wins out. His Hellenic vision wins out. And as an added bonus, he actually changes the name of the province from Judea to Palestina. Now, what's interesting about that is that that's a term that ancient Greeks had used for the region. So this is not only taking the Jew out of Judea, but imposing his sort of Greek-loving worldview over He's everything. Greek fetish. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah. And this was especially insulting to the Jews. I don't know whether it was intentional or not, because uh, Palestina comes from the Philistines, who were the ancient enemies of King David and so forth. Anyway, the interesting thing is that Hadrian has completely won at this point. Everything he has wished for has happened, and then two years later he dies. And what's really yeah. interesting is what happens in Rome at this point, because uh, Hadrian was apparently so unpopular with the Senate. I don't know why there are people who will know better than me at this point. He was so unpopular with the Senate that on his death, they were prepared to declare him a tyrant. Now, declaring someone a tyrant in the Roman Senate means that all the laws that that emperor passed would be voided. It would all be undone. And he was saved from this by his successor, uh, Antoninus Pius. And in fact, he gets the name Pius because of his filial piety to his adopted father, even though they were like the same age. Don't worry about it. He's definitely one of the more interesting Roman emperors. It, and it, it, considering he's often put in that group of the five good emperors, he's one of those um, really true exemplars of somebody who puts good ruling and administration and the needs of the empire before his own aggrandizement. And obviously he changed... You can't, and I love how you put this in your video, you can't undo the policies of Hadrian because the policies have already borne out such rancid fruit. But in this case, this guy becomes a, a definite ally to the Jews in this aftermath, does he not? I wouldn't go so far as to say ally, but he is definitely neutral. Um, there is a story that he had actually celebrated, I think, Purim uh, or some, no, oh, Tuba. Wow, yeah. He had celebrated Tuba Av with the Jews of Rome, which is the Jewish equivalent of Valentine's Day, but it's in August. Uh, I, I did not include that in my video because I was kind of suspicious of it. But he of was course. definitely neutral. He, he stopped all of the anti-Jewish policies and laws that had been instituted. But at the same time, like I said, many of the policies that Hadrian had instituted couldn't really be undone through law because one of the things he had done was uh, give a lot of land in Judea over to the Romans, to Roman soldiers. The way Romans and Jews treated and thought about land was very different. Um, in Judaism, it was very important to maintain forests. And when, and, but the Romans, who sort of, even their taxation system was based on the productivity of their land, they didn't see that as worthwhile. So you get the beginning of the great deforestation of the Judean mountains and the soil erosion, which over the centuries makes it not come back until the late 19th century when people actually start making a concerted effort to engage in reforestation. Like I said, in the Galilee, the forests are fine. But down here in old Judea, I say down here, I'm not, I'm not that far south. Uh, but down that way, uh, in places like Modiin, all the forests you see there today is less than 200 years old. Just to go back, as you said, we'll talk about this question once, once the story's been told. And as I mentioned, um, Hadrian is so renowned as the good emperor. How do you feel and how does the Jewish population as a whole feel about this title being given to him when clearly a lot of people don't know about these more, well, a lot of people do obviously know about them, but... It seems that like the full story isn't being told exactly when he's titled the good emperor and just how would you feel about that title? Uh, I don't blame people for going along with it. When that narrative has been presented for 500 years, people are going to take it at face value. Uh, my hope is that they'd be a little more critical because our understanding of Rome has changed so much since Machiavelli and it's even changed so much since uh, Edward Gibbon, who 
kind of brought back this idea of the five good emperors in the 18th century, wrote the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, uh, they had a much more positive image of the Roman Empire as a model for how to govern in the modern age, uh, which we now accept is not really the case. That Rome was not this up, upright, upstanding, I, I'm tempted to even say puritanical society. But it, it, it is difficult to sort of untangle that understanding when it's just such an omnipresent shorthand in the world of ancient history, especially for people who aren't historians. Like, especially I say, I'm not a historian myself, and I've during this second season of AD history, I've done a fair bit of research into Hadrian. Um, we've just done an episode about Hadrian's Wall. Um, I did something about the uh, Panth. Yes, thank you. <laughs> did an episode about the Pantheon before that, and all in all of my research, uh, g generic like face value research of Hadrian, none of this really came up. It's only once you dive into uh, uh, looking into the uh, Bukhara Revolt. Um, this sort of less than not good, for lack of a better term, not good side of Hadrian makes itself present. I'm just shocked that even like so many websites I looked for research didn't mention this at all. It just seems like a bigger mission when you're talking about the man, not to mention this side of him. Yeah, uh, it's absolutely the case. Uh, I think when you have when you have such a huge empire, every little piece of the empire is going to have a different experience of its leaders. They're going to have a very different impression because different things are happening all over the place. Like there's a, in, in Paraguay, there is a US president who is celebrated, Rutherford B. Hayes, who is completely forgotten in America because he ended the war <laughs> that almost destroyed Paraguay. So you, it, it, it's, you, know, you can kind of see the parallels between that and how Hadrian is remembered uh, in the Jewish world as opposed to, say, Britain. Yes. And speaking, this is uh, another question I have, speaking about being remembered in the Jewish world, uh, Bar Kochba, how is he remembered in the, uh, to the Jewish population to this day? Because when you were telling me this story of this revolt, uh, similarities came to mind to sort of an important figure in here in Britain as a Bodicea. There was just sort of, I felt sort of parallels between her revolt against the Romans and his revolt against the Romans. And of course, as a Bode uh, Bodicea is sort of a somewhat beloved figure here in Britain as like this warrior who fought back against the Romans. How do modern Jews perceive uh, this guy? Well, it all depends on the religious perspective, on the political perspective. Judaism has always been a deliberative and consensus-based institution, not really a hierarchical one. So there's always been disagreement. Uh, but Bar Kokhba historically was seen as a very hubristic figure that was not mm -hmm. a point of pride. Uh, in fact, after he died, the Sanhedrin uh, renamed him posthumously Shimon Bar Koziba, which means son of the lie. Hmm. And after that, there was actually a big debate uh, in the few decades after the war. How do, we, how do we interact with the Roman leadership? Do we remain in opposition to them, or should we try to cultivate uh, at least an attempt at positive relations? Uh, and the person who was against it, uh, the person who said we should continue to hate the Romans, um, Shimon Bar Yochai, Shimon Bar Yochai uh, is actually remember, he's the one who gets his holiday, Lagba Omer. He's a celebrated mm. figure, yet at the same time, it was the we should try to cultivate good relations side that won out. And it was people like Yehuda Hanasi, who I mentioned before, who had this special relationship with Marcus Aurelius, with Septimius Severus, and with Caracalla. And it was actually them who tried to help the Jews finish the Mishnah, gave them guards, uh, and so forth. Now, something I'm, I'm curious about, Sam, is any time there is this this coordinated revolt, especially when you know you're you're allying with people that may be in the empire from elsewhere, those who are from outside, and in some ways it's obviously even more difficult if you don't win. But there's such a different challenge between fighting a war and what came after it, and 
as is borne out in history many times when something like this happens, all of those involved don't necessarily have the same shared end goal for what they're hoping to accomplish ju just outside of getting rid of the enemy that they basically want to kick to the curb. Why were they fighting them in terms of what they wanted to achieve? Was it just to establish their own sovereign kingdom in Judea? Or were there any sort of conflicting priorities and goals among those who fought in the war? In as much as we know, because like I said, we have very fragmentary record of this. It seems like it was just a basic independence, restoration of the temple kind of thing. This was not the last Jewish revolt against the Romans, but it was the last for a very long time. Like I said, this leads actually into a period of fairly good relations between Roman emperors and the Jewish leadership. But, you know, this is such a long period. We have to remember that we can't think of the Roman Empire as being one era. Things changed no, no, over goodness, centuries no. and centuries, and relationships ebbed and flowed, and leadership changed, and what it meant to be Roman, what it meant to be Jewish changed over these centuries. And we're, you will see that in future decades and centuries as you go on in your podcast. In one of your videos, you mentioned somebody that just made me light up immediately, and that, of course, is Simon Sabag Montefiore and his uh, Jerusalem, the biography, which I highly recommend. Uh, he's one of my favorite both writers and writers of history. And in addition to Jerusalem biography, by all means, folks should definitely check out Stalin Corps of the Red Czar. Brilliant stuff. And one of the things he mentions that's an interesting theme in Jerusalem, the biography, is how Jerusalem itself, as, as old, just how incredibly ancient it is, that its importance and its priority to the outside world also ebbs and flows. And how, do, how does this work out ultimately from this point forward relative to the Jews? Well, the great Sanhedrin after this point actually leaves Yavne and goes north to the Galilee because that's where the Jews are now. The, you know, when Judea was a province, you had in the south Jews, in the middle Samaritans, in the north Jews again. And now the Jews in the south are all dead, most of them. So you, they just go to Beit Sharim, they go to Tsipori, they go eventually to Tveria, that's where they stay. Uh, because that's where the population is now. The significance of Jerusalem really does fade. And uh, Jer Jews are not allowed into Jerusalem until the time of Septimia Severus. That's the better part of a century after this. Um, and Jews aren't allowed to live in Jerusalem again until, uh, I want to say, the, the final war between the Romans and Persians, which is in the beginning of the 7th century. So Jerusalem, Jerusalem is always remembered. It's always a place that, to aspire to go back to in the Jewish world. But it's not really a living place for a long time after this. My next question, and I also saw you do a video on this, and the reason I find it interesting is because if I ask 12 different folks that I know that are Jewish, I tend to get almost 12 different answers Probably in the more. question. Yeah, and in your case, you did a vo video on what is a Jew, what is Judaism? For the benefit of our listeners, because I don't necessarily think this is something that's fully understood and in many ways kind of obscured in the minds of many, what does it mean to be Jewish to you in this case. I loved how you put it, so I, I definitely want to hear, hear it again on the record because I think it's awfully important for context purposes from where we're talking about to the modern day. So I, I really liked your answer to it, and I'd be, I'd be thrilled to hear your insights on it now. Well, Judaism is an ethno-religion. It's a, a tribal religion. So it is as much a a cultural identity as a religious one. In fact, most Jews in the world today aren't religious. Most Jews uh, in Israel aren't religious. But that identity persists because it, it transcends just that sphere of life. Whether you keep kosher, whether you follow all the laws, you're still Jewish even if you're not a believer because part of it is that that's your ancestry. And people do convert, people do come in. But another part of it 
is that, and, and another thing is that we don't try to get other people to join. It's not that kind of, we're not spreading a universalist thing. When we say God's chosen people, we don't mean that we're alone or chosen by everybody's God. We mean we're chosen by our God. But also that even when people try to run away from their Jewishness, the powers that be have a way of finding them. There are so many stories of people leaving Judaism to avoid persecution, but the people doing the persecution don't care. They, they don't see any difference. So that's very much part of it. It's, it's not something you get to leave behind even if you try, for better or for worse. That, that's quite powerful, to be sure. Mm. And Patrick... Let's let's address the question you had earlier because I I definitely think it it brings it f full circle. How exactly hmm. did you put it, Patrick? As a Jew yourself, how do you feel about Hadrian and his title, his universe title, the man who is universally known as the Good Emperor? How does that make you feel? I guess personally, to your as a as a Jewish person yourself. Uh, well, I believe Montefiore referred to him as one of the supreme monsters of Jewish history. Uh, and uh, I would agree with that. Uh, I, I don't really have very un my, my feelings about him are very uncomplicated. I always like given, giving our esteemed guests the last word. And yes. Sam, you have the last word. All right. Uh, well, if you liked what I had to say, I do a channel on YouTube about Jewish history. Right now, I'm covering various aspects of Jewish life in the Islamic Golden Age. Um, and I'm also starting a new series called Jewish History on the Road, where I go to visit historical sites that are relevant to things I've covered before, preferably sites that are less known to the wider world. Uh, so thank you for having me. I wish you the best of luck in the coming thank episodes. Thank you for coming and joining us today because yes. once we came into contact with each other and I saw what you were doing, it, well, first, just to give just a brief insight, it's not just enough to say the, the quality of the history, but the aesthetic presentation is so, so unique and it's so well done, accompanied with excellent narration and very good scholarship and, and the perspective, because I noticed you do videos that say, hey, I have some correction. This is some place where I might have, you know, I found better information. And it's a wonderful, wonderful perspective in, in a subject, certainly on YouTube, that is not covered nearly enough or from such a perspective. Right. And that's what I really find that's so novel and special about it. Well, my goal was to give Jewish history the same treatment that people give to, say, Roman history or Chinese history mm. or uh, all the things like that sort of put it in a continuous canon that goes beyond the Bible, that goes beyond the modern history, which even a lot of Jewish educations have historically tended to skip. And also put it back in the context of world history in a way that was accessible to outsiders, to people who aren't deeply ingrained, which I'm not. I'm not a person who was an expert in Jewish history. I'm not someone who knew a whole lot about Jewish history before starting the series, but I recognized that nobody else was doing it, and it would be a good learning experience for me and for everyone else. And Sam, that's exactly how, so it not sound sort of big header, him, that's exactly how Name Explain began. I thought, no one else is really doing this, so let's give it a go. I, I, I'm not an expert in etymology myself or anything else I do on Name Explain. So it, you're, you're, you're definitely on the right track. And I look forward to watching more of your videos, that's for sure. And thank you again, Sam. And now, We'll be back right after a word from Anna Domini. This is the AD History Podcast. Keep up with the show and join the discussion by following AD History on Twitter with the handle at AD History BC and the hashtag AD History. Check us out over on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube by searching AD History Podcast, as well as, of course, tgnreview.com slash AD History Podcast. Also, check out the AD History podcast on Patreon. See how you can help support the show and the rewards that await you by exploring the AD History podcast on Patreon. See the link in the description. Now, back to Paul and Patrick. Well, now it's time for our second stab at the 
Patreon submitted question for the second episode that we are doing them. And remember, one thing is undeniable. AD history can only thrive with your support. And in addition to doing things like leaving reviews and high ratings or leaving comments and thumbs ups and subscription on YouTube, your small monetary contribution on a monthly basis does more for us than you can possibly know and we can express. There's really nothing like seeing that somebody has said, I want to support you, and they do it because Patrick can attest to this. We want AD history to be what you deserve. And with your contributions, you definitely do that. And at the $5 tier or higher, every episode, we're going to choose one patron submitted question randomly that we will answer in our middle segment. And today, our question is the following. After Japan's defeat in World War II, how is it that Japanese Emperor Hirohito was allowed to stay emperor? If they had caught Hitler alive, he would have been hung after sentencing at Nuremberg. So what gives? Why did Hirohito go unpunished and keep his position? How was that even possible? Close quote. Now, Paul, that's quite a loaded question. I think you told me you were salivating when you sent me this question. This is definitely your area of expertise. I'm going to lead the reins off to you. And I want to know myself, how did Emperor Hirohito get away with uh, being emperor still? Okay. All right. So I think it's fair to say this is some very deep waters as these things go. And at times very very odious but we answer the question because it's in play and we very much appreciate their contribution so something that most people don't know uh you might know as a listener of ad history the japanese experience of world war ii as an american and as the british were largely have in view how we fought them both in the Western Pacific and, of course, on the Indian subcontinent in in Burma, in the case of the British Army, just in that rather eastern portion of the British Raj. But this all very much pales in comparison to the big enchilada for Japan, which we always say that World War II starts in 1939 when Hitler invaded Poland. And yeah, I mean, that is the traditional line. But there have been scholars and, and that make a compelling argument that World War II did not start in 1939. It started in 1937 at the infamous Marco Polo Bridge incident, where it is largely believed on good evidence that to create a false and fraudulent cases belli for Japan to invade mainland China, they came up with a dummy provocation which basically gave the Japanese a a very, very thin cases belli. And in that time there, that was the majority of the fighting that Japan did. The vast majority of the Imperial Army was in China in a protracted conflict. And of course, in 1932, they ended up taking Manchuria, most of that having to do on the initiative and somewhat in subordination with the Kwangtung Army that was there. But this, this is the drain on the Japanese war effort. And they never managed to accomplish nearly as much. But the one thing they definitely did accomplish is very little known in the West is that Japanese, in terms of fighting the Chinese, the death toll is somewhere between 10 and 15 million in seven years. And when it came to everything else and the other fights that they ended up picking, it paled in comparison to that. But essentially, here, here's the crux of the issue. So getting, getting to the question directly, The Allies specifically in the United States in this case had several major goals in rebuilding post-war Japan. One of them, of course, was transforming Japan into a representative liberal Western-style democracy, helping Japan build the foundation of a prosperous East Asian economy, which they most certainly did, ensuring Japan was incapable of posing a threat to the U.S. or its Asian neighbors by creating a new national constitution formally renouncing 
war as a means of its foreign policy, and, of course, making Japan a stalwart anti-communist ally to the West with the quickly impending Cold War. That sounds quite straightforward, but it is anything but. So, as far as this goes, one thing that's undeniable on a fundamental level is during the seven-year occupation by the Allies, primarily the United States in Japan, they were seeking out to create a national rebirth because everything after the war, with the exception of the United States, was pretty much destroyed, and mainland Japan was absolutely no different. I mean, not even just the atomic bombs, but the fire bombings that were done over places like Tokyo, they were running out of targets by the end of the war. And the fact of the matter is, it, it came to the idea that the one who was em you know, enemy number one after Pearl Harbor, Emperor Hirohito, was perhaps one of the best fundamental bricks to lay in order to make that happen. And that's pretty darn ridiculous. So, as far as this all goes, Hirohito's the only head of state of the major Axis powers who ended up surviving the war. Mussolini was very uh, notably hung upside down with his mistress Clara Patachi in a Milan petrol station as he was spat upon and all those awful things. And of course, Hitler took his own life in the Führer bunker with the Red Army within reach, to say the least. And in this case, he's the only one remaining. And this is kind of a, a bizarre thing. They're not really equal in terms of their roles. Japan is very different in terms of how they operated at the time. But, of course, as the remaining head of state, he was ultimately responsible for everything that daunting task would ultimately require accepting the consequence of that. But it's it's more than that. How could he retain his throne? Well, let's start with this. Who was Hirohito the man and who was Hirohito the emperor? I think it's best to start with saying what Hirohito was not. And in the case of relating to Hitler and Mussolini, he was not a wild-eyed, uh, self-righteous zealot who went out on a pulpit to his people and making grandiose speeches. That wasn't him at all. Japanese emperors did not act in that fashion. In fact, they didn't go out among their public at all. He grew up and lived in and reigned from the isolation of the imperial court. It's rather interesting because in his total isolation, one of the most demonstrative ways that this was expressed was during the Jewel Voice broadcast, which was Hirohito announcing to his people to lay down their arms and end the war. What complicates this further, and this is rather important though, is he wasn't simply some head of state and royalty. At that time in Showa Dynasty Japan, post Meiji era and before the end of the war, the Emperor of Japan was considered a living god. The chrysanthemum throne is held by what they consider to be the direct descendant of Amaterasu, which is the Shinto sun goddess. Hence, he was a living deity. And personally, he was interesting because he was rather stiff in many ways, uh, very practiced royal manners, things of that nature. He probably would have made a fairly stiff, but altogether enjoyable dinner companion, and he really loved studying the sciences. But a populist despot, he was not. In fact, he fulfilled the role of a ceremonial monarch in a democracy far better than a, you know, a supreme divine mandated authority to which he was born. And he was both very refined by both Eastern and Western standards, and undoubtedly all of this goes into how the blue-eyed shogun, better known as General MacArthur, kind of took a liking to him, which definitely helped improve his fortunes in the long term. But given all the contrasts, here's the big one. It has to do, when it comes to the emperor, the inherent ambiguity of ruling versus reigning. So if we look at this in the modern context, looking at your country, 
Patrick. The Queen of England reigns. She does not rule, meaning that it's much more a much more passive thing, where rule is a much more direct and undeniable and proactive form of ruling. So it, he he was very interesting in that way. It was he was always walking that line as were essentially all the emperors in the post Meiji era of being that divine monarch who was walking that line between actively reigning and passively ruling. And on a dynamic basis, this generally meant that Hirohito very rarely, if ever, delivered explicit edicts on policy matters. Most post-Meiji Restoration emperors would appoint a prime minister to act as the head of government in their name, but Emperors, the emperor's influence can best be described as a tacit or passive form of personal imprimatur. Ministers in the Japanese government would present to him an audience with Hirohito where he provided a wink and nod approval regarding the subject ministers, you know, their ideas that are being presented to him. The arrangement allowed an emperor to appear detached from politics while maintaining realistic authority and insulating him from failure or misdeeds. In relative contrast, Hitler and Mussolini were far more involved by exercising their authority. The distinction, greater than all others, however, was that Hirohito was not just any monarch. The Japanese emperor was worshipped as a god incarnate, and that complicates things immensely. And so the issues specifically regarding rebuilding Japan going forward very much is, makes it very complex for the Allies, raising legitimate questions about what Hirohito knew regarding the conduct of his nation at war, his realistic involvement in policy making, and the onerous prospect of executing a living god. And so now you ask the question, how does he ultimately serve the Allies' ends in a new Japan? And there's absolutely no question that as an absolute monarch, living god or not, Hirohito as head of state held the ultimate responsibility for the deeds of his nations at war. However, MacArthur and the Truman administration saw Hirohito's potential usefulness to the Allied powers in rebuilding a shattered Japan as far more important than retribution for his personal culpability. If nothing else, the Japanese emperor looked, was looked to by the nation for moral guidance, and nothing could be more helpful in a time of great uncertainty for the recently defeated Japan. Moreover, the Japanese people's absolute devotion to their emperor, serving as a symbolic head of state, was a potential avenue to put the nation's rebirth on a strong initial footing. The symbolism of the emperor cooperating with the allies embodied great significance, communicating to his vanquished subjects to no longer resist their former enemy. The famous picture of Hirohito standing next to MacArthur, I think probably a lot of people have seen this. I don't know if you've seen it, Patrick. I think I did see it um, when I was looking into the, answering this question myself, but you seem to be pretty on a good track here, but no, I believe I've seen this picture, yes. He stands about seven inches taller yeah. than Hirohito. It's a, a deeply symbolic photo. It, it communicates a lot in a very straightforward way without ever using words. That image, coupled with the overarching concept that cooperation of Hirohito helped legitimize allied post-war occupation and his personal value was pretty clear. It was really a, quite a leap of logic for a nation that at that time had been nourished on the themes of ultranationalism and universal Japanese racial superiority. But there were complicated realities of post-war occupation Japan, and they made for strange bedfellows. For all of the potential Hirohito had in rebuilding Japan, he would have only been useful if his personal character was in no way impugned by his perceived role and keeping that, that moral track record intact, ensuring that moral high ground that it, and it was never compromised. Hirohito and the entire imperial family received immunity from the post-war war crimes prosecutions at the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, better known as the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal. And had the tribunals pursued legal retribution against Hirohito as head of state, he would have had to have been tried as a war criminal on the same level as Hitler had the former German dictator not committed suicide in the Fuhrer bunker. But Hirohito's cooperation came at a tremendous high price, as many were calling for Hirohito to be tried and executed for war crimes. China was absolutely unequivocal 
in their demands for his execution as the Chinese endured, as I mentioned, almost a decade of barbarity at the hands of the Japanese invader. In addition to that, with that immunity, Prince Asaka actually escaped justice from the rape of Nanking, as most people would mm. better know it as, which is one of the most heinous acts of barbarity in history. And they also had to ask the question on top of it, Patrick, what mm. did Hirohito really know about his nation's conduct and misdeeds during the war? Well, this is something I was wondering myself when um, our question asked us about the Empress specifically, obviously uh, com coming from a coming from a country with royal family and the grand scheme of things the royal family don't do much here and i was curious to know if that was the same case for japan at that time was he more a ceremonious leader like the anything and that i guess as you said seems to be somewhat the case to some extent well as emperor he always had to seem above his subjects mm. and and not directly intervening in what largely was thought of as the vulgarity of politics. And I think we can get a pretty good idea of what we mean here. And, you know, the truth of the matter is rulers from the beginning of time have been in positions where various aspects of their nation at war or whatever their deeds may be, to some extent could be isolated. Because remember, their goal too was always to make sure that the emperor came out clean. And it's mm. a very hotly debated subject, Patrick, because it's almost impossible to know. So many of the people that were actually close to him are going to be very tight-lipped, and so it's an extremely difficult question to answer. But there's one thing that is absolutely undeniable. As head of state, he was 100% guilty, responsible, and should receive all the consequences for his country that he led. Undeniably, if you go into the you know, the pre-war but still post-Meiji constitution of the time, he directed the army, he basically directed everything, and if the top guy can't be accountable in truth, in reality, who can? No one, but he got away with it as basically a bargaining chip. Is that what you're saying, to keep the Japanese people happy? That's part of it. But, <laughs> but ultimately, here, here's the weird thing. So what basically ended up happening is this turned into a whole coordinated sideshow where the Allies were actively collaborating with the Imperial Court, making sure the testimony of those that were being put on trial at the Far East military tribunals in no way contradicted the idea that Hirohito was unaware of this, that in the case of Hideki Tojo, who most certainly is one of the big figures of wartime Japan. He was the prime minister when Japanese, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And so basically what they did, and it was totally ridiculous, they took Tojo and made him say in official testimony that he initiated war against the United States and Great Britain in direct insubordination to Emperor Hirohito. To give here he's to a pass. <laughs> yes. And yeah. in this case, I, I got to tell you guys, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's bullshit. It <laughs> is absolute bullshit. But Tojo did it because Tojo absolutely 100% believed in Hirohito as being his emperor, a divine being. And if this is what he wanted and this is what he needed, he would probably have seen it no different than having lost his life in battle for the same figure but it really creates a very inconvenient question patrick and you know why why because it, it is said that hirohito was not particularly inclined to attack america or britain in the western pacific and to what extent that's true we can never be entirely sure but if he couldn't stop war from starting how is it that he managed war to stop in the surrender of Japan to the Allies? That's a pretty inconvenient question, isn't it? Uh, yeah, just a bet. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is a total non sequitur from the realities of what was mm. happening at the time. And basically, for the most part, Tojo, in addition to a number of other major figures, took the fall with him, and it was a basically a coordinated effort. 
And that's very, very difficult. Now, the other issue here, of course, has to do with the concept of unconditional surrender. So basically from 43 at Casablanca, when FDR and Churchill met in North Africa, they publicly expressed that the aim of the war was the unconditional surrender of all the Axis powers. That is a war aim, especially in a war of this scale. We haven't fought one like this before or since. Even World War I pales in comparison. That is almost unbelievable because most times you can sign an armistice, come to a treaty, and move on. But that's not what was happening here. So it was a way to you know, really communicate not just to their own nations, but to the Soviets and especially Stalin, that they weren't going to make a separate peace with Hitler. And that worked out well insofar as these things go in Europe. But of course, the war in the Pacific was still going on, Patrick. It would go on for another three months. They thought it might go on for another two years. And so now you're kind of tasked with an interesting problem. The Japanese make one stipulation, which of course violates the concept of unconditional surrender. And that one condition, and let's remember guys, when it comes to Japanese surrender in World War II, it was totally anathema. Totally anathema. The Japanese didn't surrender. The Axis in Europe definitely surrendered, whether it be the US, the British, or the Soviets. In the case of Japan, they basically said, we'll surrender on the condition that Emperor Hirohito remains emperor. And this is an extremely difficult thing to wrangle with. So basically, when you get to the Potsdam conference between the major allies that was held in Potsdam, Germany, you had Truman at that point because FDR had died. You had Churchill for part of it. And then, of course, you had Attlee taking uh, his place about halfway through because of the general election in 45 and the, the labor victory that ensued. So Attlee became prime minister. And of course, you had Joseph Stalin. And between the British and the Americans who were the ones that were mostly involved in that fighting, even though the Soviets would uh, launch a very successful uh, invasion of Manchukuo, better known as Manchuria, in literally the dying days of the war, they didn't know exactly what the heck they were going to do with this guy because they don't want to lose more lives. You know, from a rational perspective, you'd think to yourself, well, you know, that probably makes sense. You know, we'll save lives on both sides. But they had this unconditional surrender thing. And so initially, the Americans in particular were very keen to have Hirohito tried and executed. But indeed, it was your people, Patrick, that said, no, uh, 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 keep him as a ceremonial monarch. And of course, just that at the time, guys, at the time... That was almost unthinkable. It was almost unthinkable. This guy had been public enemy number one in addition to Hitler and Mussolini and all that stuff. But it was actually the British wisdom on the subject that broke through. And to his credit, President Truman said, OK, I, no, I got a way around this. I got a way around this. We can still maintain unconditional surrender and keep him as emperor. But we tell them how he's going to remain as emperor. Mm. And so basically, you're at a very strange point now. But basically, what ended up happening is that when it came to the, the stipulation, it was not easy to swallow. But the truth of the matter is, guys, when you look at what the Allies were trying to do, which was they were looking beyond just the mere military strategy of things. They were thinking about the post-war world and they're saying to themselves, well, we're going to be occupying this nation and what are we going to do with them? Th that's always the difficult thing. The war is always easier to win than winning the peace, right? That's what we're talking about here. This is not so much military strategy and diplomacy. This is not winning the war, guys. This is winning the peace. And so how do you win the peace? Well, the answer is doing exactly what they did as they saw it. As the Americans and the British saw it at that point, after much wrangling, they realized that he, in a ceremonial monarch role, was of far more use to them than dangling from a rope. And so it made the stipulation possible. And all told, a, a number of things happened from there, but th this is the interesting one. 
the the occupation forces in post war Japan, I believe, at one point were just even thirty thousand, which is incredible considering you're talking about a country. I think at the time of seventy or eighty million people. Mm. That I mean the the ratio there is is pretty intense, and you see firsthand just how powerful it was for the people, the Japanese people, to hear the voice of their emperor, the vast majority of which never heard his voice before. And it's interesting because when in, in what they call that jewel voice broadcast, his language, his form of Japanese speaking was almost archaic that his people had trouble understanding it, but essentially they got the idea of what was happening. So what basically what they did was they asked Japan to draft up a, a new constitution along the lines that they mentioned, which primarily is best noted for, of course, adopting a pacifist foreign policy and renouncing war as a means of foreign policy. The problem is they kept coming back with what essentially was the same constitution they had before they were defeated. The United States sort of ended up getting frustrated with this and basically had their own people drafted up for Japan and said, pass it, put it in the diet and pass it, which is what they absolutely had to do. And they're still following that constitution today, might I add. The other thing they had to do was they absolutely had to make sure that Hirohito publicly renounced his divine status. So that way he was truly becoming a ceremonial democratic monarch and not a divine being that is by right and history and practice the leader of the Japanese people. They needed to squash it, and he did just that. I mean, imagine hearing, if you're Japanese, Patrick, can you imagine not just one, you've never heard your emperor's voice before, but two, him publicly saying in unequivocal terms, in, in, in the way that the Japanese tend to, to phrase these things, I am not a god. <laughs> it's quite, quite the thing to hear, I imagine. <laughs> it had to be, for some people, just utterly earth-shaking. And basically mm. what you got was a UK Westminster parliamentary democracy. But the cost of doing this was incredibly high because he had been public enemy number one. China had just been brutalized and they wanted justice and not unjustly for that matter. And the fact that we had to coordinate and create this whole whitewashing narrative in order to help build that foundation and keep that moral authority of Hirohito so he could be that symbol of a new Japan. And in the case of the Far East, and Japan is no different in this case, symbolism is of great significance. Words cannot communicate in that same way. And, you know, guys, you know, when you, you have to weigh the cost of it, you know, only you can decide if it was worth the cost. But I can definitely tell you this, for all that World War II meant for the Japanese vis-a-vis, -vis, whether it be the Chinese, but especially America and Japan, it never ceases to amaze me how, especially as somebody from the United States who's, who's met many native Japanese people, that even with the brutal fighting, even with the atomic bombings, and just how that post-war occupation proceeded, that there isn't this incredible animosity between the two. And I don't think that would have been possible for generations, maybe even centuries, had Hirohito been put on trial and their living god had been put to death. It was a a clear recipe for revanchism. And as odious as some of the choices were in making this happen, you have to ask yourself, was it worth it? Do the ends justify the means? They didn't know at the time, but they simply know what they needed to prioritize and what made sense in a political calculation. I mean, was it worth it, Patrick? I think yeah. From from what you've just explained to us, like as, as I haven't got much experience in in this part of history, but yeah, I think yeah, definitely is worth it for 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 what it did and for like like I sort of said, it's a bargaining chip to an extent. It kept the peace. It kept morale high. And I think I even read that 
Hirohito was seen as like a figurehead for Japan's success post-war, their economic sort of boom into becoming the powerhouse they are today, that he was sort of seen as a figurehead as re- of rebuilding Japan. And you wouldn't have had that figurehead if you had put him on trial and kicked him off the throne. Most most definitely not. And they knew they knew that was the the symbolism and the power mm. of moral authority that came with him, divine or not. And you have to give a lot of credit to the British, a lot of credit to Truman, and a lot of credit to MacArthur for conducting the post-war occupation of Japan um, so successfully. I mean, it's probably the best thing he ever accomplished. And I guess with, in saying you got to give credit to the British, I guess perhaps the British had an understanding of the importance of a figurehead symbol in a monarch that I guess America just wouldn't have. They'd understand that this, this can be an important thing to have. They they can't keep morale high even to this day you know the queen near the beginning of the lockdown here in the uk the queen did one of her like, a very rarely seen uh message you know she normally only does it on christmas day but she did one for the lockdown to keep morale high and it's a thing to this day it's in our trailer bring out, yeah exactly yeah bring out a royal family member to keep morale high and here's japan doing it here undoubtedly patrick you, uh... I mean, I I know from every, from all British that I've spoken to, everybody has kind of complex feelings on the royal family, but you do understand their symbolic power and value. Mm, yeah, like I said, I've, I've got a bit of a love-hate relationship with the royal family myself, but you can understand that they do serve that purpose. A lot of people, for one reason or another, do see value in them, and that value, I guess, can be used in times of need. It can, it can comfort some people. Oh, absolutely, and mm. I and I think you're dead on about that British perspective. And did better wisdom bear out? Well, only you can decide, our dear listeners. And we'd like to thank our patron who submitted this question. If you would like one of your questions answered on our show, donate on the $5 tier or higher on Patreon because we love receiving it. We love answering it. It's open to history in general or anything having to do with the show, or even Patrick and I in our professional lives. We'd love to hear from you, and we'd like to thank our patron today for doing just that. But now, here is a word from Anna Domini. This is the AD History Podcast. Well, that does it for us today. Patrick, where can people find us? You can find me personally primarily on Instagram at NameExplainYT. But you can also find me on Twitter at NameExplainYT and, of course, on YouTube search NameExplain. What about you, Paul? In addition to my usual work at TGNR at TGNReview.com, you can find me at my Twitter handle at PKD in history, as well as my reader submitted World War II Q&A column, The World War II Brain Bucket, where I answer all World War II related questions, which if you are on YouTube, we will have a link down in the description. That's all today for myself. Goodbye. Thank you. And take care. Yes. Thank you all so much. Until next time. Like all good things, we come to an end for today. Thank you for listening to the AD History Podcast. It is listeners such as yourself who make this show possible and truly awesome. Be sure to follow and subscribe for upcoming AD History podcast episodes, available wherever podcasts are found. Also, follow AD History on social media. Follow the show on Twitter at the handle at AD History PC, as well as on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash AD History Podcast and Instagram as AD History Podcast. In addition to liking and subscribing on YouTube by searching AD History Podcast. Do you have a direct comment or question for Paul and Patrick? Drop them an email at adhistorypodcast at tgnreview.com. Also, be sure to visit the show's homepage at tgnreview.com slash adhistorypodcast. For Paul and Patrick... Thank you for listening to the AD History. We'll see you again.